today we're talking about the 2020 Democratic candidates. And to clarify, that's the year of the election and not the current number of candidates running. I know there are a lot of them, and per the suggestion of one of my regular viewers, I should start looking into their different solutions to issues. Apparently, the debates just aren't cutting it. Solve the war in Afghanistan with an answer that we could fit on a Snapple cap. Now we're launching this new presidential series by talking about the environment, because 82% of registered voters who identified as Democrats or Democratic leaning independents listed climate change as a very important top priority they'd like to seek at the focus of a presidential candidate. Yeah, for such a supposedly important topic, we really haven't heard anything about it. So the planet is drying up in an existential threat to life on Earth. But should we allow private insurers? So I think I've found a good way of covering this story. I'm going to go through the presidential candidates in order based on how concrete and written out their positions on this issue are, so that I avoid creating equality between a guy who says, yeah, I love the environment, and a certain Jay Inslee who's published five separate policies on environmental protection? Come on, governor, I need to sleep at some point. Now, unfortunately for me, Jay Inslee dropped out of the presidential race Wednesday evening. The Washington governor centered his platform on climate change. Yeah, that came out late last night. And to just give me a few minutes to hold down the delete key on this script and cry. I actually had a joke that said, I hope I drop this episode before he drops out. And well, that didn't happen. Sorry for the long episode though, but hey, it's a lot shorter than one of those debates, and even better, there's 100% less Chuck Todd. Because Inslee's out, we're starting our script with Bernie Sanders' newly released plan. And this thing is hot off the presses from this morning. If we do not get our act together, what we are seeing now will only get worse. The most eye-catching part of this plan is its call for a direct investment of a historic $16.3 trillion in public investment towards these efforts. And before we move on, yeah, there's absolutely no way of getting around Congress on that one. I mean, maybe you could declare a state of emergency and move around a few billion dollars of emergency funds in the Pentagon's budget. But $16 trillion isn't going to be lying under a couch cushion in the Pentagon, even with how much we fund them. So before you look at this and say, well, this green plan is firmly in the red, unlike most of the plans we're talking about, Bernie Sanders' plan actually purports to pay for itself. Now it has six strategies, of which three are policies and three are side effects of more people having jobs because of all the government spending. So there's a bigger tax base and less need for a social safety net. And let me tell you, I never thought I'd see cuts to the social safety net as a revenue source in a Sanders plan, but because of all the jobs, fewer people will need it. The implementable policy pieces are, first, making the fossil fuel industry pay for their pollution through litigation, fees, and taxes, and eliminating federal fossil fuel subsidies. Now, every plan today is about eliminating federal fossil fuel subsidies, but what makes this suggestion different is the pursuit of one of the most patriotic endeavors in America. I'm talking apple pie squared, suing big companies for revenue. Interestingly enough, you wouldn't need Congress to do anything in this first section, as it's an enforceable issue. You could probably skate around the edges by executive ordering things. Now the other interesting proposal is with the federal government investing its own money in renewable energy. You see, this would expand a part of the Department of Energy's program that allows the government to compete with private utilities. This means that the government would, in fact, be collecting revenue on all electricity harvested by their solar panels, windmills, and other ventures. And it should be easy to beat them because apparently rumor has it that there are going to be all these new fees, litigation, and new regulations on fossil fuels. This would also be something that you wouldn't need Congress for, except for the part where you fund all those new investments. Third, he would cut military spending, which, yeah, that's really just a Congress thing, but I guess you could withhold your signature from a budget and shut down the government. So now that we've talked about the revenue side of this proposal, let's get to the fun part, the spending. 
Suffice to say that everything I say onward pretty much, you're gonna need congress for that. Might want to get Mitch McConnell on your speed dial. First, a large spending program to get gas powered cars off the road and replace them with zero emission vehicles. Frankly, I'm a little concerned about this plan. I mean, what's the guy who revs his loud as heck engine outside of my apartment at 1 in the morning every morning gonna do once it's electric? <laughs> this would include grants to families to buy electric vehicles, an electric vehicle trade-in program, putting infrastructure to charge electric cars, you know, so that you can get places outside of the three coastal cities without needing to be towed by a definitely not zero emission AAA truck. It would also pay to provide grants that would turn transit and school buses electric and convert our shipping trucks to electric alternatives. The second major thing this plan would do is fund a lot of research, specifically in cheaper ways to store energy, a particularly pressing concern considering that the sun has a tendency to go down at night. Researching how to decarbonize the aviation and shipping industries is also a priority and pushing to get more companies to use recycled materials in production. The next part is international actions, and this is something that's pretty unique to Sanders and ex-candidate Inslee's plans. In a bit of a hybrid between executive authority and you're gonna need to call congress for that, the president can talk but congress can act. Under his plan, the United States would invest $200 billion into the Green Climate Fund, pending congressional approval. Now, this fund helps developing countries fund green investments in their economy. This $200 billion pledge would be almost a 66 times larger investment than the current $3 billion America gives each year. With that $3 billion that we used to give, well, countries could afford to put a band-aid on this gaping wound of an issue. He would also renegotiate disastrous trade deals, his words, to protect the environment. You know how Trump is renegotiating trade deals to focus on exports? Well, Sanders is going to re-renegotiate those agreements to focus on labor rights and the environment. I know Congress hasn't yet ratified the new NAFTA we negotiated, but let's get the gang back together for one last ride. Now in this proposal, there are a whole bunch of somewhat unrelated infrastructure and workers rights things that, for the purposes of time, I'm going to skip over because today we're talking green, not New Deal. This next part gets a little bleak. It's the if you can't beat them, join them portion of his climate change proposal. It would create a climate resilience fund where at risk communities looking to prepare for natural disasters could go to get funding increase the funding for federal firefighters, and increase funds for FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency. The last major thing he would do is regulate the fossil fuel industry to death, something that liberals and conservatives would greet with the exact opposite amounts of enthusiasm. We're talking no new drilling permits, no offshore drilling, a ban of importing or exporting fossil fuels, a ban on fracking or mountaintop removal mining, a tariff on carbon intensive goods imported from abroad, and a public private divestiture movement. Now the last major part could be accomplished without congress. So that was Sanders' plan. The plans get progressively less progressive as we move down the list and more importantly for my sanity, a little less thorough. Now to someone you probably weren't expecting to see so high on this list. Welcome back to Belshane Rule. Five trillion dollars. That's how much it'll cost to cover Better O'Rourke's new four-pillar climate plan. This marking the first major policy rollout for the 2020 Democratic Contenders campaign. Only five trillion dollars? That almost sounds suspiciously cheap considering the plan we just heard. Now this plan has been described as what would happen if the climate change movement had a child with a consultant. His plan is, interestingly enough, a lot more focused on executive power and things a president can do. Specifically, using executive powers to do things like re-enter the Paris Climate Agreement, limit methane leaks from oil and gas drilling, and set new energy efficiency standards. Now I realize it's not like other candidates haven't figured out that, gee, we should tighten up regulations on our plans. 
But Beto's plan goes way out of its way to emphasize, we need Congress to do these things, and these are the things I'm going to do day one without needing anyone else's approval. His plan, as you can imagine from a more moderate candidate, doesn't require as much from Congress because it doesn't aim to burn down the system and rebuild it, but rather to work mostly with existing laws to turn the screws on fossil fuels and bring down emissions. At this point you're probably wondering, ok that all sounds fine, but where did this 5 trillion dollar expense come from? Well, This part is blissfully a lot simpler than the other plans. It's almost like he doesn't think Congress is going to pass it. And of course, this is the part he'd need Congress for. First, $1 trillion in tax incentives that accelerate the scale up of technologies enabling reductions in greenhouse gas emissions through efficiency and alternative energies. So tax cuts for green energy researchers. Man, are Republicans going to be torn on that one. Yay tax cuts. But for the environment? Oh jeez, how do I vote? But this wouldn't be entirely a public research venture, so the numbers the plan lays out is it predicts that this $1 trillion in tax cuts is actually going to mobilize $4 trillion in private investment. The next $3 trillion would be to build infrastructure. Not to be down on this plan, but this section dedicated to describing what this infrastructure would be is very vague. I just put 3 trillion bucks into the infrastructure necessary to cut pollution across all sectors, meet his net zero ambitions without delay, and to boost economic opportunity and growth. Ok, so it sounds to me like you're saying not a highway. The next part of this plan is where things start to get a little controversial, because this plan also focuses a lot on not so much fight climate change as mitigating the impacts of a now inevitable slide into climate change. Unlike Bernie's plan, it's a quarter of his. It would change laws to make sure that when we rebuild homes after a natural disaster, they're more likely to survive the next one. You know, for all those homeowners who just have to live in Tornado Alley, what could go wrong? It would also expand crop insurance, the readiness of first responders to climate problems, and expand it tenfold federal government funding for pre-disaster mitigation grants. Yep, this is another section that read like, you can't beat them, join them. Lastly, and this has led to several groups hitting the streets, but his plan says we'll achieve net zero emissions by the year 2050. Now that might sound like a great goal, but activists are saying, no, we need to achieve net zero emissions by 2030. Interestingly enough, the bar setting Sanders plan set the net zero year at 2050 as well, and Jay Inslee's plan had that bar at 2045. But nobody really seemed to care about those. Now the next candidate's plan we're going over is, well, this one's going to be another huge surprise because most of you have probably never heard of him. Senator Michael Bennett of Colorado has served in the U.S. Senate since 2009. He has also been one of the Democrats considering a run for president in 2020. Yes, Michael Bennett, the one from this corner picture that you did not recognize. He is from Colorado. And no, he did not pay me to put him higher on this list than Elizabeth Warren. She's coming, don't worry. First, let's get it out of the way that this guy might not be a hard environmental guy to support, as he's backed natural gas as a transition fuel to zero emissions. Now, here's a better picture of him because most of you probably have no idea who I'm talking about. And I'm being told that did not help at all. 40% of the country says they don't recognize this guy's name. And I'm sorry, that means that the other 60% of the country are liars. Anyways, Michael Bennett's climate change plan. His plan is a lot more focused on not spending federal money. Instead, he wants to leverage private industry and customer demand to transition the country. Some of his trademark ideas are, hey other candidates, hope you're listening because there are a few gems in here. First, he wants to create a climate bank that would provide loans and other financing options for states and private companies looking to invest in clean energy and climate resilience products. He wants to start the bank with a cool trillion dollars in federal funds, but because it's a bank, the goal would be to get it to be entirely self-financing. The other, hey, that's kind of a cool idea you have, 
is mandating that every utility provider in this country give customers the option to be provided zero emissions electricity if they so want. Lastly, the goal with Bennett's plan is also a 2050 zero emissions set. So people who think a lot about the environment, they're a bit iffy, and honestly this plan would probably be a little more controversial if anybody knew who Michael Bennett was. The last thing his plan does that's different from the others is have a very specific timetable for his first 9 months in office. That includes the phrase, reverse this administration's policy on, and executive action on regulation quite a few times. The last key piece to his plan is a little bit of a cop out. He's going to use an executive action to create a climate change committee whose job it is to draft America's climate change plan and all associated legislation. So yeah, a part of his plan is to get a plan, which doesn't have the best optics to it. So that's Michael Bennett in a nutshell. Next it's to the elephant in the room, Elizabeth Warren. Climate change is real, and we have a moral and economic responsibility to make changes in this country starting right now. Don't get me wrong, there is no shortage of Elizabeth Warren policies on climate change. I mean, if I had a penny for every Warren policy out there, I'd probably be able to single handedly fund Bernie's climate change plan. Unlike everything we've talked about so far, though, she doesn't have an overarching climate change strategy. She's got five tangentially related policies that would all help in the climate change fight. Instead of a huge meal, with Elizabeth Warren, you get a bunch of different tapas. This would start with her public lands plan. Now this is all executive action based, sorry Mitch McConnell, and would see a no new drilling on public land, much harsher restrictions on current drillers, and harsher enforcement of the Clean Water Act. Now the second piece she's talking about is her military climate change plan. Maybe a wind powered Abrams tank? Not quite. Instead, it would have the Pentagon allocate funds to A. Make all non combat bases zero emitters by the year 2030. B. It would fine military contractors who do not achieve zero emissions compliance. Don't worry, our napalm fires are all carbon captured. And lastly, C. It would allocate billions to the Pentagon for research into micro storage and creation of micro grids. Next, to trade. Now this proposal isn't huge on the environment, but it does mention returning to the Paris Climate Agreement and eliminating government subsidies for fossil fuels. Now this part would be a lot more relevant if I ever need to go back and do one of these episodes on trade. Next, we see Disclosure. Now this one is a bit on the weird end, but it basically directs the Securities and Exchange Commission to issue rules to make every public company disclose detailed information, including the likely effect on the company if climate change continues at its current pace, and the likely effect on the company if the world successfully restricts greenhouse gas emissions to meet the targets of the Paris Agreement. Now you might be wondering like I was when I was reading this, why the heck would you do any of this? I mean, what? Well, after reading through the plan a few times, it seems like the goal is to basically use these corporate disclosures to make fossil fuel companies look like terrible investments, and shift investors' money towards green energy alternatives. Finally, and unfortunately for those of you who are enjoying this nice little respite from seeing a multi trillion dollar price tag on things, well, we come to her manufacturing plan. This is the plan she talks about a lot in the debates. The basic idea is we're going to put $2 trillion into researching, manufacturing, and exporting green technology. First, this would trigger the Green Apollo program, which someone's trying a little too hard to sound cool. Now, this Green Apollo program would invest $400 billion into clean energy research and development. The second thing this would do is put aside an additional one and a half trillion dollars for the purposes of purchasing American made clean, renewable, and emission free energy products for federal, state, and local use. Basically it's Elizabeth Warren saying, if you build it, we will come. 
Lastly, she would create a federal office whose sole purpose is using America's arsenal of diplomatic and trade power to push foreign countries to import as much of our made in America green tech as possible. So that's Elizabeth Warren's many, many plans on this issue. Blissfully enough, this covers all of the major candidates who have a plan about climate change. It's safe to assume that if you didn't hear your candidate's name, they probably have said that they support the Green New Deal and a few other vague things. But no plans have materialized yet. Don't worry though, they're probably not driving around in Hummer limos clubbing seals out of an open window. Thank you and phew, that is all I have to say about that. Hello YouTube, I'm trying out this new method of talking about candidates' policies. If you have any suggestions for how I could format this segment better, please let me know in the comments. I know this episode was really, really, really long and well, I'm curious as to whether that was a problem for you or not. Believe me, I was hitting the delete key a lot by the time this got uploaded, but who boy was there a lot of information that felt pertinent. Now if you want to support independent nonpartisan news, remember to subscribe by clicking on this floating logo to the right of my head.